during the brands taking off. And so we kind of went from one experience of basically pleading with anyone in London to put any money into the business to then like everyone in London pleading to put money into our business. I think it's like the Goldilocks rule. You always want to be slightly out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Um, if you're too far out of the comfort zone, you'll just have a breakdown and you won't be able to handle it. Yeah. And if it's too easy, it'll be boring. Um, so we did, and we basically spent nine months of our evenings building a system that you could input how good of running you are today and then click a button and it tells you what you should do. Making a bit of money, seeing some really good data points in lots of different ways and we're able to excite some investors. And for context, this is like the worst point in time to raise money. Ben, how are you? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me today. Hey, absolute pleasure. I'm, I'm excited by today's conversation. There's, there's a lot to talk about because you've had a, an amazing career today and are building something very special at the moment um, in Runner, which we're going to kind of dive into. And you're repping the merch today, which is, which is always good, always useful. Um, but before that, I wanted to talk about your early days and where you started and, and really what childhood was like, because you're now, I know you won't call yourself an influencer, but you've done a lot within the fitness space. So you're doing a lot within running at the moment. And like I say, building Runner, but what was childhood like for you? Was it was it fitness, fitness, fitness? Was that what you were brought up on? Um, well, I'm, I guess, very lucky. Grew, grew up with, I guess, two pretty smart, successful parents. Both Amazing. went to Oxford um, oh. and dad ran a successful financial business. Um, Mum did a kind of doc, well, studied as a, as a doctor at Oxford, um, didn't do her practical years and became an actuary. So both kind of had their own very successful careers. Um, and I think that very much like pushed me and my three siblings um, all down the route of kind of succeed in academia as much as you can um, and then go on to get a really boring financial job. And that was kind of like the career or the like life path that we were kind of put on yeah. based on maybe what they had lived and they saw as success. Yeah. Um, and so I think like, yeah, maybe that was the kind of like predisposition that we were like put on a path to do. Um, and I was always like, I don't know, did well at school in terms of I was intelligent, but I had no interest in anything at school. So my mum would always do you mean, tell me off for not working harder, not doing better at my exams, not doing revising, not yeah. reading, not doing any of these things. Um, and at like probably like 14, 15, I think my parents were very much like very concerned. I would play Call of Duty all day long. I was short, not that I could do anything about that, but I was, <laughs> I was a fat kid eating sweets all day at school, coming home, like rushing my homework mm. and then just playing Call of Duty all evening. Really? Um, and that was kind of like my life. I, I thought I was very happy and I probably was very happy. Um, I would then buy loads of sweets, sell them at like double the price so that then I could eat half of them and then do you mean sell the rest of the half to then buy nice. more sweets for the next day to then keep eating sweets all day at school? Yeah. Um, and that basically took me up to like 15. Mm. Um, and at the time I had no interest in sport or exercise. And I would always, I guess I was probably like the, I always say I was the second fattest kid at school. Um, so the one who could actually get bullied for being fat because you can't tease the really fat one. Um, so I was like the, the one that was actually like the, the fat one that could get teased. So I got teased for being fat. I was always doing right at the back of like the kind of school cross country. But again, I would come like second last. So then people yeah. could tease me for it. They can't tease the one who did really shit. <laughs> um, and anyway, I think um, and my, my dad used to cycle to the office and he was a relatively like fit guy. Hmm. Um, and I think my parents were like desperate how they get me off Call of Duty and how they could actually get me to do something in my life. Um, and so my dad really started like pushing me to start cycling to school. Um, and I think at the same time I was like maybe 15 kind of age of like starting to like girls didn't like the fact that I doing, wasn't looking great, mm. probably associated like doing getting a six pack one day, being big and strong with being cool. Yeah. Um, and probably also had my dad like hounding me to like actually start, start cycling to school. Um, so I started cycling to school and at the same time started going to the kids gym sessions at my, my gym. You had to be 16 to go to the gym. So I went to like yeah. the, the kids hour. Um, and at, and at the time I basically started to find endorphins of exercise and very quickly stopped eating sweets um started going to the gym every day after school started cycling to school racing to school as fast as i could and like doing didn't have strava and annoyingly i don't have strava so <laughs> i can't look back and see actually how fast i was but i remember like knowing that it took me like 26 minutes and it would be like yeah, if yeah. i can get like 20 25 30 it was like a good day yeah um anyway so i like, started cycling to school started going to the gym and i guess like quite quickly became um i think started to see a lot of progress in the gym started to get like recognition from the boys at school almost like mm. the cool i remember the cool kids like one of them being like shocked that i like suddenly wasn't fat i remember in my head it probably didn't quite go like this suddenly wasn't fat uh and suddenly like had started to like grow some pecs yeah uh, and you're an all boys school sorry I was an yeah, all boys school. and i remember being able to like 
tense one chest muscle at, the, at a time. Nice. And like instantaneously. Like the wrong like, thing. Really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Instantaneously went from like not being cool to like suddenly being cool, uh, which sounds ridiculous. Um, and anyway, like it, it kind of like the whole way through school and then through uni, all that really mattered to me was being huge. Mm. Uh, I wanted to be big and strong, look a certain way because maybe initially I was motivated by yeah, looking a certain way to doing gain status and yeah. doing impress girls. Um, and I think very quickly I found endorphins made my life better mm. um and it kind of stayed all the way through um uni um that it was about being big and strong i played sport at uni i would um i played lacrosse and in my final year went on to kind of run the lacrosse club which became um at the time the biggest club at the university right. um and all the while started to kind of get this idea that fitness was going to be hopefully my career um, i was doing a geography degree because i couldn't get my mum off my back who made me do a geography degree yeah, so my niche? my well my my decision making process was um, basically picking the easiest degree to get into hmm. that led to like the maximizing of not having to do a boring job when I was older, um, and one of them was also that it had a good male to female ratio uh, of um, people doing the course. Uh, so essentially, it was a way to kind of tick the box that I was doing an academic degree for my parents. Yeah, um, I had no interest in geography or anything other than fitness uh, and still Call of Duty. Um, and yeah, good ratio of men to women. Um, it led to the most number of statistically a, a geography degree leads to the most number of like, um, career options. So for someone who didn't know what they wanted to do, mm. but probably knew what they didn't want to do, it was a good way to like, not put myself in a box, I guess. Yeah. Um, and went off to, went off to uni and again, had zero interested in the geography. Um, and I was actually like really homesick and sad in my first year at uni, just because I was doing something that felt so purposeless. I'd sit in a lecture and probably for certain people but particularly for me sitting in a lecture and listening is not a way to learn mm -hmm. um and i was tr trying to concentrate because i knew i kind of like wanted to do well to go get a job one day and i just would sit there and an hour would go past and i'd have like heard nothing yeah um and anyway so um put all my energy into into the gym and, and yeah. everything else there um and because it feels like in those early years like when you were younger going into university and kind of in secondary school etc et finding the fitness side also gave you quite a lot of purpose right yeah absolutely and i think um it was yeah definitely gave me a lot of purpose definitely the first time i'd started to be very good at something yeah um and it was interesting at, at uni um i i quite quickly was one of the biggest one of the strongest guys at the university i could do bench press the most i could squat the most and um as a result it was like the place that i felt doing people would respect me hmm. um and it very much helped in other areas like so i went and joined the lacrosse club and I, immediately i was able to run around the pitch faster than everyone else and actually be quite good at it despite not being that coordinated yeah um so that was that was fantastic um and and at the same time i think i felt very homesick i had like um none of my close friends from school had come to the same university as me mm. i think i'd been put in a flat where just unfortunately i hadn't made loads of amazing friends yeah um, i think everyone wanted to, to go off and do drugs and do all of their things which wasn't really for me mm. um and so having the gym that gave me that purpose it was something that i was able to keep getting better at um and kind of like put all of my energy into yeah um and to the point where in my christmas holidays of my first year so kind of done a doing three months on the first term come home and i remember being able to say at the dinner table like guys i i know what i'm gonna do when i'm older um feeling like really proud really sure of something and i remember saying like i'm gonna go into fitness and do any qualifiers of pt as soon as i graduate um how did your parents take that well my my mum's immediate reaction it, the table went silent because like all of my siblings knew this was going to be like hilarious um, <laughs> and they waited and the first person to speak was my mum, and she was like right we'll cut your allowance you get used to being poor um which wow. um yeah and, and i think like, it's always been like a, an interesting one because like from she was never doing it from a perspective of being evil mm. it was more that from her learned experience going and doing a current conventional career path conventional education leads to good financial yeah. life and an yeah, easy yeah, life and sure and success and that's what ultimately like what she wants for her children um but at the end of the day like i don't think i would have succeeded if i'd done my three-year geography degree and gone and worked for a conventional mm. accountancy company and done that for 50 years i'd have been miserable and and probably not done very well yeah um anyway so i think like that was the the kind of point at which that was what i did and i think i was so sure of it that even though my mum didn't really agree um i still wanted to do everything i could to learn i was doing in my evenings watching youtube videos of people in the gym and doing slowly over time it transitioned more from just the gym to fitness as a whole mm. um in my final year um, at university i'm running the lacrosse club which is coincidentally where i met my now co-founder yeah 
Um, but I'm running, running the lacrosse club has become the biggest kind of sporting club at the uni. Um, and I'm there leading the, doing the, leading the session, the training sessions, uh, leading the warm up. So, so many useful skills, like public speaking. First time I had to speak in front of like hundred people at training, yeah. organizing the 12 people on the committee, putting the socials together and managing the accounts of the, the uni club. Um, but the, the real thing that I did that really started to kind of like teach me for what I went on to go and do was I set up our kind of like lacrosse fitness club. So it was like 20 people of the club that would come to like one of the small uni gyms that I'd book out and I'd put on like a PT session for everyone, despite not being qualified, but as a way to like practice <laughs> yeah. for when I was. Um, and within that kind of group of maybe 20 who had come to the gym with me, um, we also put together a group who went on to do the Southampton Half Marathon. Mm -hmm. So in my final year studying, I did the Southampton Half Marathon amongst like, I don't know, 15 of, of the other guys in the club. Yeah. And again, one of those 15 is my now co-founder, um, Dom and Dom. Amazing. Well, we'll get on to the running side for sure, but I want to go back a little bit. The The difference from being in the lacrosse team at university and kind of running 100 people as a team and 20 people very intimately, five years before, like you say, not really being listened to because of the way you look and the way you feel, etc. What's that contrast like? Yeah, no, I mean, I've never really thought back to that. Um, I mean, I th I'd say I never felt like comfortable to speak in front of people and even yeah. now like this is a really peculiar experience to talk on a podcast and <laughs> i find it a peculiar experience every time i host a run club and yeah um cajole a number of people and tell them what to do mm. um so i think it's probably like an element of like i think it's like the goldilocks rule you always want to be slightly out of your comfort zone yeah um, if you're too far out of your comfort zone you'll just have a breakdown you won't be able to handle it yeah and if it's too easy it'll be boring yeah uh, and i think it's probably an element of that like running a uni club is the perfect way to like do we get a bit of life experience? But it's not like running a real business. No. Um, and doing from there, I went on to doing start taking some real qualified doing group classes in Southampton, and then I progressed from there to go out and um, kind of run the fitness department at a five star hotel and started taking doing all these different classes and yeah. taking morning runs, taking group cycle rides. Um, came back from there and start taking in group sessions in different amazing gyms and places in london go on to do my own private pt gradually making things kind of like more and more complex over time and hmm. slightly more and more scary and doing now it's doing leading a run for doing a few hundred people yeah. with runner um it's so like that's right. not so scary based on what i did like a month ago yeah but based on what i did like five years ago it's impossible. Yeah, yeah and i think like with that in mind like to anyone who's like thinking how do i get to five years away it's almost like don't worry about that just like be good in a week and yeah what you'll then be able to do in two weeks is is only achievable because of what you do in the, the, the week interim. And you don't notice these small steps when they're happening, but then when you zoom out and look back, they seem kind of like this crazy ladder. How do you climb it? Yeah, no, for sure. And in it, just one last thing in those kind of earlier years for you, you, do you think you're addicted to the fitness stuff? I think I'm an extremely addicted personality. Mm. So I, I'm, I think, and I don't know enough about autism and ADHD, yeah. but I think, and I don't even know which one it is, but I think one of my parents is is either, and I can't remember. My older brother's explicitly autistic. My younger sister is ADHD. Yeah. I'm quite sure that I'm on like the spectrums of them. I've never been tested or whatever. Mm. Um, and, and also on my mum's side of the family, like there's a few kind of alcoholics as well. Okay. Um, I think I'm an extremely like addictive personality, but I think yeah. I'm also quite like in control enough to know what to like be addicted to. Yeah. Um, maybe when I was addicted to my Call of Duty phase, like that was not that healthy. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I didn't have anything better to do, so it was fine. Yeah. Um, and then doing ever since then, it was probably the gym for a very long time. Um, and then from the gym, it transitioned into Ironman, and we can talk about talk about that. Um, and now it's runner, but I haven't lost my passion or enthusiasm for the Ironman and all the exercise. Mm. So it's very hard to be extremely addicted to both. Um, and therefore, one has to give all the time, and that's frustrating because I can't nail both as well as I would like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think like with that in mind, like knowing that that maybe is like a personality trait is a mm. very powerful thing and probably lets me work harder than normal people might want to work without yeah. it feeling like prison. Um, but at the same time, probably need to make sure I avoid certain things. Otherwise, <laughs> that could be really bad. Yeah, I mean, it's, I kind of resonate with it personally because I've, I've always had that. I mean, people have always told me I'm addicted to, to building what I'm building. And, you know, I've always been a bit worried about it from like my perspective, yeah. thinking like, I know I've got an addictive personality. If I go too far into things and I've always stayed very far away from the bad stuff if I'm honest but those sort of addicted feelings it's very kind of going to that flow state with it and you know we were talking kind of off camera about a bit of cycling and stuff which I'm into and I just find that you know I do get really addicted to those feelings because you're addicted to the endorphins etc but it seems like 
luckily you've put all that addiction if we call mm. it that into a into positive outlets that you can actually be passionate about and have you know i guess good angles i'm sure we'll talk about how getting involved in the business so deeply can also yeah. have negative impacts but it feels like that's where you've gone with yeah it. i think the thing that i've dis- i think the thing that i have discovered that i'm addicted to yeah is progress as in like i'm not addicted to when i play call of duty like <laughs> even looking back at it i was addicted to like improving my like kd ratio which is like your kill death ratio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. i was addicted to like unlocking the camouflages to get the cool guns so i could like have the coolest guns at school yeah like so even in that ridiculous phase i was addicted to getting better mm. um during then the gym i was addicted to like getting a six pack improving my bench press looking phenomenal during then i transition into running into iron man yeah. i'm addicted to do i first of all finishing an iron man i do my first iron man and then the goal is like i could do better mm. and the goal in fitness ever since has been get better at iron man get better at running and cycling um and that's never changed mm. and now i'm addicted to running this interesting business yeah and making it better and like even today like there are so many gaps and opportunities for us to make it so much better mm. so i'm like so obsessed with like finding those cracks finding the solutions and the solutions aren't very easy to find and then like working on those and by the time we solve them some new cracks will happen and we'll make them better um and so it's like i don't think it's that like i'm addicted to like i'm not just addicted to drinking beer and lying in bed and ruining my life i'm addicted to like getting better at things yeah um and relatively i think if i find something that can make me excited to want to get better at it i find it very hard to like think about anything else mm. um no i resonate with that quite a lot so at uni you did your first half marathon was that your first ever half it, so it was my second i did one with my um dad's like corporate place he got and did yeah. that when i was 17 and then yeah. didn't run basically from 17 other than like running around a sports pitch or running around lap of circuits class yeah. class until um this kind of half marathon at, at 21 do you remember it the half yeah i do distinctly um partly because um there are a few photos of me at the finish line in very short blue shorts um and it looks like i shot myself um <laughs> and, the, and, and i didn't uh, but they were too short so my thighs rubbed right. um to the point where they chafed and then bled uh and then the blood dried so the finish line looks like i've shot oh, myself kind of like when blood kind of goes a bit brown it goes a bit brown and, yeah. and there was like quite a lot of it uh-huh. to the point where like i finished i think i did um i did a 128 half marathon so i was like a really fit guy despite being probably like 95 kilos and and huge 95 um, kilos. but i like dude i really committed to this half marathon did did relatively well there, and i'd always been aerobically fit despite thinking about um kind of the goal being be big and strong but yeah. i always wanted to be doing lean and have a six pack so i did my cardio and then yeah. really committed to this half marathon but yeah finished that half marathon with a very uncomfortable situation and i got escorted off to the medical tent once they realized it wasn't it was blood yeah um and that felt ridiculous because there's all these people passed out and i'm there like just with some sore thighs mm. so anyway they like cleaned me up and sent me on my way um and then as a uni student who can't really afford the taxi or whatever i remember having to like waddle for like half an hour with like being two mates to get to like the burger place back where like student accommodation was because uh, so that wasn't a a, a fun wall but yeah i remember it and it was a um a very proud day because it was the first yeah. time i'd really like been able to have see like see the people that i'd helped in their running journey, like actually gone to achieve yeah. something. and Because it was 19 others and you. Right? I can't remember how so, many, right. many of us it was, but it was a team of like doing 10, 15, 20 of us right. um, who went on to do it. Which and is, you were the best cool. runner at that point, effectively? Yeah, I was like, the, the best runner of the, of, the, of the group. Yeah. Um, and relatively, the, well, like the fit guy of the group who was leading all the strength classes and then also putting the runs together. Yeah. Um, but it was a, doing a relatively social, fun group of people. And yeah. Like, I knew that my career was going to be fitness and I assumed it was going to be be a PT and go on to set up a warehouse gym one day. Mm. Um, and it was that this kind of like, this really started my love of, of running. Um, was that, I think, that the race that started it? Yeah. And I think um, at a similar time, so that race must've been like, it must've been April. I, I'm quite sure it would have been April. Um, and no, it is because I know when the Santa Marathon is and it's at the same time. But anyway, so that was in April. And at the same time, I remember in, it, it's starting in April. So one year, which will have been the same year. So when I did this half marathon, finishing in April, I'd mm. accidentally been to the gym 365 days in a row. Accidentally. I, I hadn't missed a day. And I always marked it down on this like piece of paper that I had just because I like to have this like piece of paper that I tracked it all on. Um, and I hadn't missed a day. But not because I was like obsessed and I needed to go to the gym that day, but because I loved going to the gym. Like it was right. my favorite thing I'd do in the, in the day. And sometimes if I went to the gym in the morning and a friend wanted to go in the afternoon and was texting me if I'd already been, I'd be like, I'll just come again. Um, and relatively, that, I mean, it was a whatever obsession. Um, 
But it got to the end of this 365 days and I was like, well, this is a bit silly now. And I'm also at the point where I'm, you know, I'm not going to get any taller. So if I get my big, my muscles bigger, I'm now just going to look more and more silly. Um, so I kind of like needed a different thing to do. Mm. Um, and I basically was lying in bed one evening, knowing that I'm kind of like known as known of as this kind of like the hardest, the hardest guy will do whatever crazy challenges that he can think of and yeah. run around the lacrosse pitch, yeah. like faster than anyone and just like run around like a crazy person. Um, and then Jimmy go straight off to the gym and whatever. So I wanted to find something hard to do. Mm. So I was lying in bed and I thought I'll just do an Ironman. Um, so I signed up for an Ironman that day. And I also wanted to like work out what to do with my doing 365 day streak. So I'd, I thought I'd park going to the gym every day. And I decided to try and run an arbitrary distance, but I picked 2,500 kilometers. So from April till April the next year, I was going to run 2,500 kilometers which averaged 49k a week or 7k a day. And at this point, you hadn't really run that much. So I'd, I'd run a half marathon, but probably, well, maybe I hadn't run the half marathon. I, th- I don't think I'd, maybe the start of the March. So yeah, I hadn't been doing much running. Fine. This and is I, before the Southampton. This before is the half marathon. But you're so 95 like, kg and just uh, wham. I'm 95 kilos. I run like, I've probably run like three times this year. And right. I'm like, fuck it. Let's just like do this crazy Damn. challenge. Prove everyone that I am like, this crazy person they all think I am. Yeah. Um, and almost immediately get shin splints. I did the half marathon Southampton. Um, and like I would track it in this like meticulous spreadsheet to check I was on track and going to yeah. meet the distance I needed to run. Um, and eventually like completed the year. And then three months after completing it, did my first Ironman. And just um, for those that don't know, how long is an Ironman? So an Ironman is a 3.8 kilometer swim, mm-hmm. um, followed by an 180 kilometer cycle ride and then a marathon. And often, most people, how much are they training before they do an Ironman? Like um, in terms of, I like would it's, imagine so. Like building think, up to it. Yeah, right? I think normal people will do. We need to be into fitness for a while. Yeah. Um, and then I think, yeah, probably like explicitly training for it for a year. Um, which, in a way, like I did do intentionally. So I've yeah. got this year where I'm saying I'm going to run like crazy. I'm ra- raising money for charity. Amazing. Um, and then um, completed the year with an Ironman. Yeah. Um, and it, and it went really well. So I kind of graduate uni get to go and start work as a PT and have this purpose, have this mm. structure in my life outside of work. Yeah. Um, and coincidentally, I also started work for a private PT studio in Southampton as a way to avoid moving back in with my parents to nice. probably doesn't approve of my, my fitness career um, and started working for an ex-professional runner in his kind of private PT studio. So I was learning a lot about running coaching from him, mm-hmm. gradually started to do some kind of one-on-one private coaching with some of his clients, partly because yep. he knew I could run having done this half marathon that was relatively good and then went on to do a few more over that year. Um, and so did that for nine months mm-hmm. um, and then shortly went out to live and work in Greece. So after nine months working in Southampton, get this get this amazing job running the, well, starting off working within the fitness department in a five-star hotel in Greece and shortly became the like kind of head of the fitness department and went on to run all the, kind of sports and activities out there what made you want to do that um so it was it was actually at a hotel that i'd been to as a guest when i was growing yeah. up which is a very very doing lucky experience to have um and it was always i think i always again looked up to those people doing running the all the doing what looks like now as the kids running all the different yeah. areas of it like what an amazing experience yeah um and so i thought that doing that would be a really fun thing to do for a year or so yeah um and also it was the best way to gain my experience in the fitness industry. Really? In, in the way that there were 650 guests every week, probably 100 of them would engage in fitness classes or mm-hmm. runs or whatever. And so as a result, I got to teach, do you mean, or get to n- learn the names, get to learn the, the difficulties and the things that 100 different people wanted. Yeah. And then they'd all leave and I have a new 100. And as a result, rather than having like 100 clients all year round, I had a hundred people that I had to get to know quickly, learn their names, make sure I could like think of exercises for each of their different injuries and really learn quickly and then like ship them off and go and do the same with the next batch all year round. Um, and as a result, I probably got to like coach over the two years I was there doing like thousands of people yeah. and I'd have never had the experience to do that yeah. in any other way. And at the same time, I was also doing like a breadth of things. I was leading morning runs I was taking people out on doing cycle round, cycle rides around the mountains and all Amazing. sorts. I was leading legs, bums and tums classes. I was putting on like water polo tournaments, a weekly triathlon, and then you know, managing a team of different people in the fitness department. So it was a an amazing learning experience in hindsight. Yeah. Um, and a, also a great thing that's shaped my love of fitness furthermore. So not only did I do this iron man and then think right back to the gym um partly because the last few months of training for this iron man i'm now living in greece where the gym is in the basement of the hotel right, and my so cycle- you started this before your first iron man the job yeah so the kind of like the year 
got it started right as I was graduating, did my year, nine months of it since Southampton, the last three months are in Greece, yeah. and then probably three months later, see Ironman. Um, so I'm like in Greece for the first or the last three months of training for this Ironman, uh, which was a great way to get super fit, training out in the heat, training out in the mountains of, on this island in Greece. But at the same time, the gym was a dungeon and doing on the ground floor, yeah. a pretty shitty hotel gym. So the gym was a bit boring mm. and it was so fun to go cycling in these amazing places, to go running outside. Yeah. And as a result, I kind of realized that I don't really like lying on my back and just making my chest bigger, partly because like maybe there was less purpose or less reason to mm. do so. Um, and maybe I kind of completed it or or whatever. Um, obviously, you can keep making your chest bigger, but I had I had, a, I had, a, I had a previous girlfriend that kept telling me, like, stop making your chest bigger. It's already big enough kind of thing. So I was like, maybe what's the point? How strong did you get in just like figuratively uh, from like a... My like bench press PB is like 145 kilos. Oh, wow. So you were like, um, yeah, strong. I mean, like I'm still a, a bigger guy than the average runner. Yeah. Um, and bizarrely, despite having now hardly been to the gym other than like functional gym work to yeah. be a good strong runner and, and triathlete. Six years later, I've like hardly lost very much muscle mass. Mm. Um, so I think I weighed 97 kilos in my kind of like peak of big, strong gym girl. probably yeah. still like 8% body fat. Wow. I'm now 90 kilos and probably slightly fatter. So I've like lost a lost a little bit of muscle, but like not a huge, huge amount. Yeah. Um, so you realize it kind of in the hotel, in that gym? Yeah, I like think actually... I was just like, I, I, I thought I was doing this Ironman as a... Mm. I'll do one, prove I can do it and really prove that I'm hard as nails yeah. and then go back to like my normal life. Mm. I'd actually realized that this was super fun. Did the first one. I was like, that was amazing, but I know I can do better next year. Yeah. And like, I know this year's Iron Man, I'll do better than I did last year. Mm. Like I have not completed it. And yeah. I I also know that I don't think I ever will. Yeah. Um, did, what was your goal with the first Iron Man? Did you just- Just, just it? complete. I, 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 I like literally Googled that night. I was lying in bed and I like was Googling what's the hardest thing you can do. And like, I, I concluded that doing an Ironman was the hardest thing you can do. So therefore I signed up to do this yeah. Ironman. What was it like, the first one? Um, well, it clearly wasn't so traumatic that I went to do another one. Yeah. Um, How many have you done now? Seven or I've eight? I've done seven Ironmans. Yeah. my eighth one this summer. So I went to do my first one in Norway. Um, went out with my dad. He came to support me, which is amazing. Um, we had a beautiful day of sunshine. Remember, like swimming in the lake, 3.8K sounds like a long time, but in the proportion of... I think the whole day took me 11 hours and one minute. So, and, and that might sound really sad because I was one minute over 11 hours, but I was actually aiming for 12 hours. So I was 59 minutes. In Congrats. The race. Um, Congrats. But like the swim took me about an hour and 15 minutes. So relatively mm. compared to this 11 hour adventure, it's basically the warm up. Yeah. Um, and I kind of have one pace when I'm swimming. I'm either swimming or I'm not. And it was whatever. Got round, get out of the swim and get on with it and yeah. go on this six hour cycle ride. And because I've been out in Greece cycling in the hills, in the mountains, in the sun, like I was like, this is absolutely fantastic. And I remember like at halfway on the course, I think you cycle past like where the kind of center point is. So I cycle past my dad and there's a video of me running, cycling past being like, I feel fucking amazing. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's probably still on like an Instagram highlight somewhere. Um, and anyway, then like you carry on, finish the cycle ride. And I, I'm, I'm just like high on life. I'm like yeah. the whole way around kind of like, it's hard. It's a really long day, but I kind of like, know I'm going to do it. Um, and anyway, then during, start doing the run. And I remember like during tearing my top off, like running past my dad, like, this is amazing. <laughs> Just like so much adrenaline. Yeah. Um, so I'm doing it. I'm sure it hurt, mm. but like maybe looking back and forgetting what it was actually like. Um, yeah. Remember it being amazing. And I, and I remember literally getting back to the hotel, like three or four days later, I've now got my Ironman tattoo on my ankle and I'm back at the hotel and I went out and did all my favorite routes. And like during in on my during time off, yeah. I basically like went back and did all the hardest hills, and I just did like PBs, like everything. And I genuinely think I was like high on adrenaline for like two 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 weeks after this Ironman, really. Um, which is probably like not what a not what you should be doing after you finish an Ironman, <laughs> which is like chill for a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, recover, yeah. Recover and rest. So after, I mean, the Ironman time in Greece, you come out to the UK, and when you come out to the UK, you're kind of focused on personal training and, and kind of. Did, were you a bit? not sure where you were going to go at that point yeah so yeah so the only build is that so the job in greece was a summer job so it was right. basically april till november so i had to come home in the winter in between my two years so that was a really interesting time because i knew i was coming home and i knew i was going to go back again i had a kind of promotion to go back and be the yeah. head of all the activities um and in that time i knew i needed to i knew i wanted to work in the fitness industry i knew i wanted to work for a gym but i didn't want to work for a gym i really liked for the reason that i knew i wanted to quit uh, almost like during, if I was going to work there five months, I was going to hand in my notice after month two. Yeah. And so I think I'm a very inquisitive learning type person. Um, and I always have looked at certain 
businesses and certain structures in the fitness industry as things I don't like. Mm. Um, and I always hated the idea of working for a big corporate gym, basically. Right. So I went to work for one of the big corporate gym chains um, and got the job straight away. Um, and Why didn't you want to do that? Sorry, just what, why, why were so you opposed to it? I think there's kind of like two particular businesses that I look at which have inspired part of the reason why Runner is the way it is to not be anything like them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that is that fitness is all about um, kind of, one, one is kind of accessibility um, and one is like education or helping people. Yeah. And like, I love helping people. That's why I, that's it helped me make my life better, helped me give me purpose. And as a result, um, I loved working in the small PT students. And I loved the job I got to have in Greece, even though people would come for a week on holiday to have a nice time in the sun. Some of them would come and join some classes and actually go away and, I hope, I do know that some of them did, but like go away and actually like make their lives a bit healthier and happier yeah. uh, because some, some of them came out the year after and some of them even run the London <laughs> Marathon this week just been and oh, got to see some amazing stories um, there. But so I like loved getting to help people. Yeah. And then I look at like what a big corporate gym chain does, which is first of all, have a huge joining fee, mm. which is ridiculous. Imagine you are the type of person that's like not, not been to the gym before and you've been inspired by something on your Instagram or meeting your friend at the coffee shop who said go off and yeah. go and join a gym this year. And you're like, okay, I'll go and walk to the gym. And you open the door and you get to the gym like, hi, I'm like a bit nervous, but can I join the gym? Like, yeah, 150 pounds. You're like, that, that's ridiculous. Mm. Yeah, um, and, and also you're tied into a long gym membership, yeah. um, which is really ridiculous. If you want to go and do PT at the particular place I was at, it was a minimum of a six month contract. If you took, if you wanted to- To be at the gym and have a personal- So if you wanted to, so you're, you're a member of the gym, you've paid your joining yeah. fee, you're paying your subscription, which is probably like an annual membership or yeah. whatever. Then you want to go do PT. And I was meant to be like on the floor perusing people and getting them to sign up PT. I found it embarrassing yeah. because it literally had to be like, oh, you want to do PT? Well, here's a six month retainer or like whatever that you've got to do to do it. And then if you wanted to go on holiday, you'd have to double up your sessions a week before you go so you don't just lose a session. Like, how inaccessible is that? Mm. And anyway, so that was like an amazing learning to get to go and observe that. Yeah. The other example of fitness businesses that I don't think are so well structured would be that of Weight Watchers, mm-hmm. which is one that relatively confuses their customers with points rather than educating them about calories. So they maybe lose some weight because they follow the number of points they're meant to eat with Weight Watchers, get to the weight they want, and then don't really know how to eat healthily. So they go, yeah. go get fat. It's almost again. dangerous. That and, and, and then they have to go and resubscribe back to Weight Watchers to go yeah. get healthy again. And it's just create yo-yo dieting, whatever. And I think those two examples of businesses are the exact opposite of the way that we try and build runner today. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so that was why I went and worked at this particular gym mm-hmm. chain. And I won't share his name. Of course. Because um, there were lovely people working there. And yeah. like the, the other people there were great, but it's just the whole ethos. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I went back to Greece afterwards, had an amazing time. Um, and that was when I then come back from Greece. So kind of have done my two years there. Um, and so I didn't know more. You didn't want to go back again. So it was, it was the best job in the world. Like genuinely, I could not think of a better way to spend my day. Yeah. That like, as in I'd literally wake up, I would cycle from my like staff accommodation two minutes up the road to Gosh. go and take a um, group of like 15 people on their holidays who are so happy to go yeah, on a run yeah. with me. And I'd take them on a run in to like sun. beautiful headland and I'd oh. run basically with the fastest person at the front. And then we would like yo-yo around the back of the group and then carry on going. So I would get to run fast, but also keep everyone together and everyone yeah. have a nice time. That was a 45 minute run or a 30 minute, depending on the, the day's schedule. I'd then go and eat my breakfast in the guest um, hotel yeah, yeah. buffet because I was a manager. So I got to go in, the, go in there. Then I would have like intentionally planned the fitness timetable that then I would just about make it in time for my Pilates session at like 8.30 in the morning. Then I would go in straight. I, I basically would back to back classes really early in the morning. So I'd do like my run, Pilates, probably be like a legs bums and tums for an example or then like mm. an abs attack and i would be doing every rep of every session really? until like 11 o'clock when it's now like too hot for people to do fitness classes right and so then i would basically go windsurfing for like three hours until like the afternoon session start and then i've um then i'd go and take a long cycle ride up the mountains get back and take the evening stretch um and then a five aside game of football and like that was my day to day it was unbelievable and at the same time managing the other cycling instructors and fitness yeah. instructors and kind of intentionally but they didn't know it at the time i was cajoling the timetable to give, give me a great day every day um they're all sat there now like damn that's yeah what doing. and it was actually so perfect the way the hotel was structured so the hotel was like slap bang in the middle and you had the beach on one side and then you had like all the nice places to go cycling yeah. so the bike team were on one side of the hotel and then the fitness was on the other side so like if i wasn't cycling they would probably think I'm doing fitness. And if I wasn't doing like the fitness, they probably thought I was cycling. Yeah. And but I can, actually just, like, I can actually just go from like the fitness to the to the windsurfing yeah. area. And then like 
then to the cycling and then and i'd be like oh exhausting on the fitness <laughs> side and so, so like it was a great life but at the same time i knew i didn't lead anywhere mm. as in like i could have had a very happy time there from doing i was 22 and 23 when i worked there yeah um but i wouldn't be able to have a family one day and i didn't also want to progress anymore and i think maybe not even realizing it but maybe like progress is something that like means a lot to me yeah because i didn't want to become the hotel manager i would have been able to relatively progress with the hotel manager he was I don't know, 27 guy, absolutely amazing, lovely guy. He started on the beach, became the beach manager and then becomes a hotel amazing. manager. But like, I didn't want to live in Greece in this amazing hotel and then watch everyone do the fitness while I'm stuck in an office managing the whole hotel. Hmm. So I knew I'd like capped out to like the optimal role and I didn't want to go any further from there. And I also yeah. am an ambitious person to some extent, wanted to be able to buy a house one day, wanted to be able to have a family and kids. I wouldn't want to do that in that type of environment. So come back to London, um, kind of, right next to Richmond Park where I grew up um, and started doing a number of different things. So I started working for a few different gyms and outdoor kind of fitness instructor classes type businesses. What was the plan at this point? Sorry, were you just like, I just need to get back into the seat? So I knew I was like moving home yeah. and I did move back in with my mum for the first time. How was she, that? Well, she hated it. Hated <laughs> it. Uh, probably not like fix those wounds since. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I knew I wanted to join, be a successful yeah. fitness person, coach, at the, at the time in London, in Richmond Park. I wanted to be outdoors. Richmond Park was as close as I could get to like replicating being on a nice island in Greece. Um, but so I worked for a number of different fitness businesses as a way to like kind of expose my coaching to people and then also did my own like private one-on-one -on -one stuff. And I had, um, I guess, started to also do a bit of online running coaching, partly because some of the guests would come to the hotel, um, would then you know, want advice as what they should do when they get home from the hotel. So I remember there was one amazing woman, Katie, who just did the marathon um, yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so she was my first online running client by accident. How did she um, do yesterday? So she did her first ever marathon um, and an achievement that she, she's a very special person to me. Like she's, yeah. um, I guess when I met her, so she came to Greece two years, the first time round, she hadn't run for 10 years. And I was like, doing chatting with her, telling her to come and do the morning run. She hadn't run for 10 years. The last time I did, I did a half marathon as a bet and then finished at the pub and basically just go to the pub all the time. And I was like, come on the run. And then she basically went running that whole week. And since then, during, I then didn't hear from her for a year. She comes back to Greece the second year and is like, looks like a completely new person. Like, June massively got back into her exercise, got into her running. Wow. Um, and anyway, then she comes back in that second year and she's four weeks away from her first or her second half marathon of but first for 10 years, mm. um, comes in all the runs. And then she gets home and she's like, shit, what do I do for the next four weeks? So I'm like doing chatting with her on Facebook chat at the time and send her four weeks of running training to do. Um, and when she does it, does this half marathon and is like absolutely delighted that she can do a half marathon. Um, and then she was like, what do I owe you? And I was like, no, no, you, you genuinely don't owe me anything. Like, I'm just happy to help you. I'm busy doing my happy life in Greece. Yeah. Um, and she was like, no, just name a price, I'll happily pay you some money. So I was like, okay, when you wire me 20 quid, here's my bank details. And she wired me 80 quid because she was like, well, you coached me for, eight, for four weeks so there's 80 quid. And I was like, okay, great. Like, go rid of that awkward situation, get back to like chilling out in Greece. Um, and then she's like, what, what do I do next week? And then here are like two more of my friends who also want your coaching. So like it accidentally created this kind of like online coaching thing. Wow. Um, anyway, then coach Katie for a number of years. Um, I even did a few boot camps with her. So when I'm, I come back to Richmond Park area, I set up my online and my in-person running coaching business, working for a few different gyms and outdoor fitness businesses at the time, doing my Pilates, doing my spinning instructor, doing all of these different stuff, um, but also coaching her and now a growing number of people online um, and progressed. Well, it kind of each summer I would go out and do a boot camp for her and her friends in Switzerland, which amazing. is amazing uh, and relatively felt surreal to go out to <laughs> Switzerland. She paid for the flights. So I put on this fitness week yeah. um gave me a bit of money and then i got to like bolt on like two or three days to go cycling in switzerland and Perfect. come back and go back to the gym and back to um Brisham park um and then she went on to start training a runner after we launched runner and uh, completed her first marathon on the weekend and had her, journey. had her sister cheering her on and I even high-fived her halfway around she's wearing a runner tank top and felt like a huge um a full circle moment. full circle and, yeah, and yeah. she's also um, i think very grateful from the other side of how it's changed her life and i think like Perfect, that right that's something that like is i guess what like keeps me going now and we can talk about talk about runner to some extent but i think like the thing that means so much to me being a coach is like actually seeing the effect it has on people's lives and like having the effect that like i'm so privileged to have been able to help her or like touch her life in a tiny way um 
And like each individual that I've been able to do that with is like absolutely surreal. And I'm so grateful for that. And it got to the point where I had 40 online clients and then basically parked that business to automate it and become and build what Runner is now. Yeah. And that was a really hard psychological position because I went from basically being able to see my clients, some of them, not the online ones, but the in-person ones once a week mm. and seeing how happy they were, seeing their bodies transform, seeing that, do you mean the delightment after getting a PB on the weekend and then see me for their strength session. Mm. And then like to stop seeing my clients and they became this like online statistic of our 10th client and our 50th yeah. client and our 1000th client as we go on to launch this automated business. And it's a very bizarre one. Um, and it, as a result, I feel super amazing today coming on the back of London Marathon yesterday, whereby I got to meet loads of people at this after party that we put on at the Red Bull HQ and see them all be like, thank you for making a wrap. Um, yeah, and that's a, that's a bizarre thing. And as a result, I've always had to like remind myself by actually reading the reviews and remembering that these are real people, even though I don't know them. Mm. Um, and as a result, like Runner's gone on to be this thing that's now helping hundreds of thousands of people, um, which is infinitely more powerful than I could have ever done with the 40 people that I could coach because I realized the online couldn't scale beyond 40 people. Yeah. Um, so I'm extremely grateful and recognize the impact that that can have. Um, but it definitely took me some getting my head around it because I yeah. didn't get to see the effect of it. Mm, the adjustment period. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about that then. So you, you're, you're PTing, you've gone online, you're sort of building that online business and then um, Dom, who's your older cross buddy, he suddenly comes around and says, there's a smart way to do this. Is that basically what happened? Yeah, exactly. I think like pretty much exactly that. I think it must have been about two years that I'm home from Greece, building up my business. Yep. Um, lockdown comes as well. So I really am focusing on the online side of it versus the kind of in-person bits around Richard so 2020, Park. 2021. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think the additional notes, so Dom kind of gets back in touch. I've helped him for a faster 5K. He left me for a while. He came <laughs> back and I helped him for his first marathon. He did the Athens Marathon then leaves me again um, and then comes back and says like let's like get in let's he shows get, up get when he wants something well it was more i think that's also a normal way that and it goes back to the weight watchers point it's a normal way that people train for different running or fitness yeah. goals and that's fine yeah and so then when we think about how runner can be it's like come and check it out for free see if you love it and only if you love it stick around and if you need to go go no like you don't need your six month years membership at the gym you go when you want and come back when you want and yeah. i think like making it so easy to go it makes it so easy to come back um, but anyway, so like, yeah, Dom kind of suggests automating this. Um, and I think the only extra like additional note to that was that I was very lucky that I think the week that I got back from Greece, one of my best friends who followed Joshua Patterson, an ex Maiden Chelsea reality TV star on social media, he posts like looking for a London based running coach. And at the week that I came back from Greece, she sees the story. I didn't follow Josh at the time. Mm. She DMs him being like, get in touch with Ben. He comes over to meet me. Um, and he's one of these now in-person clients that I have. And I helped yep. him go on to do some amazing challenges. So like one of which was he ran in the lockdown, ran around his patio in his garden, but like the room, the size of this room, I remember seeing non-stop this. 24 hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He then went on to run seven, uh, eight, seven marathons in seven days around his patio again. Um, and then a year later goes on to run four marathons in 24 hours in the four different countries of the United King Kingdom, traveling between like Wales, sorry, Ireland to Scotland. Yeah. I met him on the Scottish English border at midnight and then ran a marathon with him in England, flew to Wales and then runs another marathon there and did it in like 23 hours and 47 minutes. So part of also having a, a client like that doing so well, showcasing that journey also then really meant that I needed the genius of Dom to come along and say, all right, let's, let's go and automate that. Yeah. Um, so we did. And we basically spent nine months of our evenings building a system that you could input how good of running you are today, mm -hmm. what you're training for, what your schedule's like, how fast you are, how far you can run, and then click a button and it tells you what you should do. And it would generate a PDF. Um, and so we essentially went on to launch this on the internet, on a website, and me try and push it out to my like 2000 Instagram followers. Um, and gradually have evolved the business for the three in a month three years and a month that have evolved since mm. um the business was called the run buddy it was a website you come on the website tell us about your basic kind of stats of where you are with your running journey what you're training for and we build you this pdf and it would take i think like three seconds to make your pdf and we'd email it to you and it was really funny because like maybe of the first like 20 plans we sold like five would email back being like no no no, you haven't personalized it that was you really came right away and we're like okay well that's just like how technology works <laughs> so we added a 15 minute lag um and then you added the lag we added a 15 minute lag so as in you got the email immediately being like thank you we've got your order you'll have your personalized plan soon 
and then like you got your personalized plan it's like your plan has now been personalized yeah uh, even though it's just automatic um, and it's just a funny a funny thing and then we never had people complain that it wasn't personalized again um and so, so what, what was the mission or i guess the the kind of a thing you were trying to fix when you started that because dom obviously saw something in you and your abilities within the technical side of of running and what that looked yeah. like and you obviously knew that I've got all these people wanting something from me and I've got the knowledge and skill set and the passion and the purpose to do it. But what were you trying to come together to solve? So I, w- I was charging £25 a week at this point to right. 40 people. And I was basically writing the same thing for everyone, which is that like, oh, you should be running three, four, five times a week. You should be doing some easy runs, some intervals, some long runs. Like your long run should be 15K this weekend and yours should be 12 and yours should be broken down in this way and that way. But like, it seemed just like so blindingly obvious and it almost felt like i was like conning these people out of all this money because hmm. I, you know, I was charging them a lot of money it was like yeah. over a thousand pound a year if you were to coach with me all year round and it felt so easy and so simple and then i also had like doing my friendship group all kind of like wanting to get into their running wanting me to help them and i was like i can't write you all plans because i can't do it for free and i'm too embarrassed to charge you this money hmm. so like just like just do it yourself or like here's a basically here's a client who's as similar to you as possible and then just like follow their plan yeah uh, because i like, didn't have the time and it, it yeah. was just this like it felt like a, it's a very complicated thing to do but it was simple enough that i could see that don was right and what he presented to me on the first evening of our doing sessions was like a path to make it work um so yeah we spent nine months of basically putting this together that could build as close as possible to what i was making for this 25 pound a week basically and i was emailing sorry i was whatsapping out personalized google sheets of what you should do for the next two weeks and each two weeks i send you a new one so basically we wanted to basically replicate through this automated system building a sheet that was 16 weeks long that would match what i was basically doing in two week chunks and that's what we did um and we would charge it for five pound a week so you came on and bought our 16 week marathon plan for 80 pounds so it's five times cheaper than my re- regular business yeah um and as a result that ex- initially sabotaged my <laughs> coaching business enormously um and, and so it should and so as a result very quickly scaled back my income to the point where i'm only doing enough pt sessions to kind of pay my mortgage i in hindsight stupidly bought a house a month before launching the run buddy nice um which is very much not what you want to do when you've got a startup well, good to have, uh, to have yeah. my like first uh regular fixed uh expense yeah um, but anyway like scaled back kind of all the private coaching i was doing scaled back all the group stuff i was doing scaled back the online coaching so we could really focus on runner uh, or the run buddy at the time um and so we traded these pdfs or sold them online for the first 11 12 months um we went on to raise a crowdfund so we sold 10 percent of the business to 303 of our earliest customers um and raised half a million pounds um and at the point we were able to kind of really commit into this kind of journey of launching it onto the app store mm. um and so in april 2022 we moved over from the name the run buddy uh to runner and yep. launched on the app store in april 22 yep. 2022 um, and at the same time, launching our subscription system as well. So moving on from selling these upfront PDFs, you could subscribe and train with Runner and have access to your plan, adjust your plan, and uh, and do that at any moment throughout the entire yeah. kind of journey. Um, and since then, we've been able to grow from having zero subscribers um, to two years later, and to now having kind of doing well over hundred thousand mm. people training with us in one hundred and eighty different countries, um, and doing half of them are not even in the UK. Uh, and that's like that's the that's the scale to, of it and that's the influence that we've kind of been able to go on to achieve um which is obviously amazing but at the same time it's so exciting because like maybe going back to progress again and i didn't realize this was going to be the theme but, uh, <laughs> maybe that is the theme um but like there is so much left to do as in yeah. like we feel like we built like 20 percent of the app mm-hmm. which is so exciting because from a consumer's perspective like we're the highest rated running coaching app in the world highest rated running coaching system in the world and we've got all these amazing we've got fifteen thousand five five star reviews now yet like we feel like we're like we're like half we're not even half built the house mm. um so no we're gonna get on to that for sure why did you think starting with dom would work um well i think so he had put a little bit of thought into it and kind of asked to catch up on this monday evening and right almost had a i think there was so he, he had put a bit of thought into it, which showed me his kind of like thinkings and like needed this information from me and then almost sent me away with homework and wanted to catch up on the first day. <laughs> and I didn't really feel like I had a choice of other than like, first of all, I had to take the call because he's a friend. Yeah. Um, he, was a, he was a paying client. So I felt it'd be too rude not to. Mm. Um, and so relatively, I was like, wow, this is actually really interesting, really exciting. Yeah. Um, and then also I needed to catch up with him on Thursday to deliver the work that he had asked for. Um, so... I wasn't kind of like, I, I definitely wasn't the type of person that wanted to be 
to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to go and be a founder or whatever. Mm. I was very happy, had a very good life, working probably 35 hours a week, earning 5K a month as a 24-year-old, was yeah. a very happy person. Yeah. Um, so relatively, I'm a crazy person for throwing a little away, all away, working infinitely harder now and not really having any, any more money to show for it. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was that like I believed in Dom. Dom's a, doing Dom's a genius. He joined the lacrosse club in his final year um, as a fun social thing to do around his electronic engineering degree. And he went on to get the top electronic engineering honors at Southampton, which is one of the best universities wow. in the country for that. Um, and what was he doing? Because he was working so at McKinsey, he worked, right? he worked at McKinsey, yeah. working in tech there. I mean, one of the smartest, most successful guys I knew. So like, I couldn't not <laughs> explore this. Yeah. Um, and it basically just was like a really interesting way to spend our evenings. Um, and it was Mondays, Mondays and Thursdays. And then it became every night of the week. He'd take his annual leave, come and stay with me in Richmond. And we'd just work on it. And I genuinely thought it was like, build it, put it onto a website somewhere. No one will use it. I can get back to my life and get rid of Don. Like genuinely, that was what I thought I was doing. And I thought it's really cool. I can basically build this thing so my friends can actually have free running coaching with me and like people can use it online, but it, like it'd just be this side thing and I'll focus on my life. Um, and what happened is nine months later, we launched it in, during the 19th of March, 2021. And like, I think we had like four people buy a plan that day and we're like, oh my God. And then like, no one bought a plan the next day. So I thought, oh, thank you. We can like, <laughs> like, and then like 11 people bought a plan the day after that. Yeah. And like, then they would email back being like, this is great, but imagine if you had that thing. And we're like, oh, well, now I have to go do that thing. And like, we're just still there. We're like, just like, did you think it wasn't going to work? The things that. Yeah. Was there a point where you think it maybe wouldn't work then? Um, I never thought that it wouldn't work. Right. But I like, I didn't care. As, mm. as it might sound really silly, but I, I just wasn't the type of person who wanted to be a successful entrepreneur. who wanted to do this amazing thing and change the world. I just like, I just wanted to have enough time to go and do my Ironman training and like yeah. help people. Were you still um, training at this time for more? more yeah. Events? I mean, so I'm never stopped so yeah, I did yeah. that first time and I, my life goal really outside of work is to just get better at my own man and be yeah. as fit and healthy and happy as I can be mm. um and now runner takes up a, a lot of time <laughs> that maybe that isn't the most important goal or the most or the one that gets the most amount of time yeah uh, but yeah that's that's never changed mm. um but yeah I don't think I ever thought that it wasn't wasn't going to work but I definitely didn't necessarily on day one thing like this is my future right. um and I think as soon as we launched it it's became clear that it was when you first did that kind of raise of capital the crowd from from your current customers and i'm sure yeah. friends and family and stuff is that the bit where it started to feel very serious for you yeah i i think like there wasn't like a day where it changed as mm. in like and i think that's probably the same with like my getting into the gym like my iron man training my progression with getting better at being a coach like we started with a Monday evening. It became Monday and Thursday. It was then every night of the week. Like it's obviously quite a serious thing. I'm like missing out on seeing my friends. I'm missing on missing out on taking on PT clients in the evenings because like Dom wants to have a call with me. So like it's quite serious. I remember having like I th probably the time that it became serious was I had a. It was kind of at the end of the lockdown, so it was when you're all on, online doing Google Meets or whatever. Yeah. Um. And I remember inviting my like eight best friends to like a Google Meet to show them the system work and like doing this was still months before we went on to launch the business we hadn't gone yep. up with a name and got a website but i remember like being like guys this is obviously gonna look really boring but like um doing simon tell me your 5k time okay how many days a week do you want to try i'm like sharing the screen and i'm like okay cool like watch this and i click a button it's like generate and it's like okay now i need to go to this other thing to load the server okay click go and then come back and i'll be like look simon this has got your name on it and it's got like your name over there and it's got your paces like how cool is that and everyone's like it was really not that cool, like, what a waste of evening. But, like, that was, like, that was probably when it started to feel serious. Yeah. Uh, but even now, like, it doesn't feel serious. It's, like, it feels like a silly evening project that, like, me and, me and my friend from uni are just, like, working on. And we've got all these fun, silly people that hang out with us in the office in this silly place. Uh, and that's, like, on the weekend, I was, like, being fun and silly with a megaphone, shouting at all these people running past us. But, like, I'm just not a serious person. So yeah. that hasn't really, like, become serious yet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's great. It's, it's great that you still enjoy it. I think that's the most important yeah. thing. Even through, like, like I said at the start of this, you guys are growing so much from what we see on the outside, and and it's taking those bigger steps. And I'm sure we'll get onto the team sites and and some capital raises, etc. Like the stakes are getting higher and higher, but the joy, the enjoyment's still there because that that feels like if that doesn't exist, what's the point? Yeah, and I think it's like you can talk about like raising money, making a business. Like it all comes back. Like the only thing that Dom and I care about is basically building the app that needed to exist when he first texted me and was like, can I, can I coach him? Yeah. And like that app doesn't exist yet. Like there's still so much more that we want to build with it. And so dream with that in mind, like we're just so excited about thinking about all those different things. And at the same time, 
now we get to have people whose lives are changed by the 20% thing we've really built. Mm. And like, that's amazing. Like an example of that would be um, doing one of our developers who lives in Brazil. Um, he um, got in touch after seeing an amazing one of the videos we did with the running channel and show, they showcased some people training a runner. He saw it, got in touch. Um, and he kind of had the, just the most amazing experience um, of kind of developing Apple Watches so, or, or Apple Watch apps. So he got in touch and wanted to work with us, got the job. Um, and at the same time, started training a runner. He's been with us now for six months, maybe seven months. In that time, he's lost nearly like 20 kilos. And he's a dad of wow. three girls. And like genuinely- 20 kilos? Something, something in that wow. region, like a, a, a like life-changing amount yeah, of yeah. But like not because he's like on the whatever, he doesn't have to. It's because he's training with an app that's genuinely helping him. He's really enjoying it. He's having so much fun. Like he's thinking about what carbon shoes to go and buy because he's so excited to buy it. And he's just like- fall in love with running in the way that I love running. Mm. Um, and he will live longer. He will see more of his children's lives. Like that in its that in isolation yeah. is enough to make like working hard for the last three or four years worth it. Mm. Like in isolation. And the same with like doing seeing Katie run a marathon on the weekend, the client I talked about from Greece, like yeah. in isolation, that is like that is enough. And to like doing to see reviews where people have reviewed us in Australia, they came across doing the run buddy you bought this free plan you bought a plan um and doing have used us for a few years later and went on to do a marathon and cite that it maybe helped them give them structure or help them get through um doing a hard time in their life through depression with the structure the app gives them like that's mind-boggling that that like is the impact that we c- we can have by just thinking about building this like good running coaching app mm. um so i think like that's the excitement that's the thing that makes it so fun because there's like is real impact we get to really help people and i think like as a result, there is good, strong economics with the business that's going to help us to raise money, help us to build this into this amazing yep. thing. But like, who cares? Like the thing that matters is we can make this thing that can just help so many people. And that's so exciting. Yeah. Uh, and then at the same time, now we, between, we've got a team of between 60 people, 45 in person in London, uh, full time. And they're all fantastic, fun, energetic people who care about the same thing. And so we're all there sitting at lunch talking about these fun silly ideas who's done this run on the weekend and what they're working on and whatever it is and so it's just like it's just fun yeah Um, and I think like obviously creating a culture where you work is not something that necessarily happens by accident but it's it's also not that complicated we want doing for Dom and I we want to have a really fun time going to work we want to work with really nice fun kind people we want to have like doing make sure that everyone's encouraged to go and exercise when they want to go get outside and doing have a good good life because life is more than just work. Um, and I think like that's something that by trying our best to make that good for our employees, it then should circle back and come back to be nice for us as well. Mm. Um, and obviously we still do, we don't just like stop at 35 hours a week and go and chill out and relax. Like we do work really hard, but I yeah. think it's that we're all in this together. We're a big team um, and we're working on something that's so fun. I think that like, um, that is, I guess, what gives us all the energy. Yeah. The just trading back slightly to um, Run Buddy at that point, when you changed the name and rebranded, at that before I ask you why, who was involved with the company at that stage? Because you're talking about the team you just mentioned, so yeah, like 45 people at that point, a six to nine months in, it was it just so you and Dom? Yeah, so um, Josh Patterson, who was our, uh, who was my private client and yeah. one who really helped, um, I guess, put a lot of exposure on me and then also exposure on the business in its early days as he went on to train with the Run Buddy. Yeah, um, he invested um, and gave us enough money or put enough money into the business that it meant that we could go and hire our first full-time individual. So we hired a guy called Walter, um, who's now our CTO, and he helped start building the early early stages of what the app would look like. So in this year, we're trading as the Run Buddy. Walter's working behind the scenes, getting it ready to be an app. Um, and we also had uh, one other, KT. Um, so she was someone I met at a run club in London. Um, she was a um, PE teacher in her summer holidays and exploring the idea of another career. Um, and work with us 10 hours a week to help us with like marketing and customer experience and just like anything that we could do to help like put runner in front of more people yep. the run buddy in front of more people um, and at September she went back to school and it was like oh shit what do we do now I think I watched uh, a video where Josh is talking about your first event after COVID and he mentions to Katie the fact that she pulled the whole event together was that the same yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She, she did everything so like yeah. the whole now, what we now call like the business development side of the business or everything that I manage there's so like tech and not tech and I do the not tech side. She basically was like, me and her just did everything. Amazing. Um, and yeah, so she then went back to school in September and had to work her notice until Christmas when she joined us full time. And we're like, oh my God, now I've like, we've like lost our 
other employees we went from being like four employees to being three employees and, and obviously josh as well being the extra one um anyway then she joined us full-time in um i guess january of um 2022 and yeah. it's been a i guess my first employee that i've managed since um and now we've joined, joined dom had walter and i had katie um, and now that's scaled to 45 full-time and relatively even split across the tech and the non-tech side yeah. of the business um, and doing on the non-tech side we've got so many different strands and we've had to slowly do you mean, bring people in to help manage them as they've all scaled and grown mm. um but you know we've got everything from customer experience partnerships marketing affiliates um events and now podcasts that we're launching ourselves kit like there's so many different things going on that yeah. like um and do you mean, that's not just like a london-based business anymore it's a huge global business yeah of course so why did you change the brand what made that decision yeah so i, I think the last thing we had to choose to launch as in we were ready to go we had the tech ready the website was re- almost ready yeah we needed like the logo that sat on the website and to get the logo we had to pick the name and we just couldn't work it out but anyway we stumbled across the run buddy because we needed to pick something and, and i think in hindsight it was a really good name mm-hmm. um and um quite quickly we ditched the the just like we learned in facebook they ditched the the so we should copy them and became run buddy so it was less of a mouthful um and became run buddy um but we then realized that Run Buddy was um, the dot com. Run Buddy dot com was taken by a dog treadmill company. So <laughs> it was a van with some treadmills in it, and they would drive it to someone's house, put the dog on a treadmill, give them a bone, and get rid of the dog and drive it somewhere else. So uh, they wouldn't sell us a dog. That was the niche business of a van. <laughs> I, well, I thought it was an April Fool's when I found it, but I was like, this is a real business. Anyway, they wouldn't sell us the dot com, um, and relatively, you probably don't want to be associated with that business. Um, additionally, there was another app actually that was already trademarked to the business, so we needed to get a new name, um, and that's an absolute minefield of trying to find a new name. Like genuinely, I think businesses in twenty years will be like cars and number plates because there's just nothing left yeah um there's no dot coms left there's no like trademarks left so i'm like i think we got it at the right time um we genuinely struggled so hard to find anything that had the name run in it we wanted it to have run in the name um and anyway luckily stumbled on runner after like month a month or two of like pulling our hairs out trying to find something and it worked relatively well we knew we could get the trademark because there was no brand out there of anything similar to runner mm-hmm. um but we couldn't get the dot com the dot com was owned by some random person somewhere who had bought hundreds and thousands of websites in the earliest days of the website, probably for like a penny. Yeah. Um, and had listed runner.com on his website for 50K. And he, I think he owns shopping.com. He owns unbelievable generic names, some of which are still out there. So go and look for them and buy them up and whatever. Um, but anyway, listed for 50K. And we're like, we're a tiny business at this yeah, point. Yeah. Like the most we've ever spent on a thing would have been like 2K. Um, and we did probably didn't have 50k in the in the bank account yeah. almost almost certainly didn't um but we knew we needed to rebrand um so we decided to go for runner anyway knowing that we get the trademark we got join.runner and we got get.runner and runner.fit um approached the guy with the tra- the, the dot com can we buy it we'll give you a grant he said no 49k knowing it was listed at 50k he said 49 so we're like, okay <laughs> this is this is painful 2k he said 48 we said three and a half he said 46 and a half and then we said, 5K final offer. He said, final offer, 45K. So we left him alone. Um, and we carried on the route of getting our trademark approved. And there's like three stages to a trademark. The first one's the only one that like was going to stumble us. And we got through the first one. So we went back to him with the evidence from our lawyers to say, we are well on our way to a trademark. No one's going to be able to stop us. The next two stages are like kind of uh, arbitrary for us. Um, so just so you know, no business in the rest of time will ever trade under the name runner.com. So your .com is worthless. We will honor our offer of 5K for 24 hours. And 12 minutes later, he sold us a .com. Uh, anyway, so really? that's, that's what um, gave us runner.com. That is an uh, amazing yeah, story. So, um, yeah, we were able to rebrand as runner and never really looked back since. Got the trademark approved around the world and um, we're now runner. And I think it's been a, a very perfect name in hindsight. Like we yeah. genuinely stumbled on it, not knowing what to go for. And I think what's so lovely about it is that we can say everyone's a runner. Like, and I think that is something that like I feel so passionately about is that we need to be a service that helps doing Dom, the man who was looking for a, 18 minute 5k and to do his first marathon but runner is also the service that's going to help someone do their first ever 5k and someone do their first ever ultra marathon and we need mm-hmm. to serve the entire scope of everyone along that way um and doing relatively we're a service that does cater for a lot of that but there's so much more we can do to keep making it more accessible and be the opposite yeah. of those doing fitness businesses that i think are built wrong yeah and the launching the app that kind of initial phase the team is more you've you've luckily got the right domain etc that's all happening what was that time like for you guys do you know what launching the app is 
almost everything is underwhelming. Like you probably look back and think, oh, was it like, <laughs> so did true. you like click a button and fireworks went off and you're on the app store. It's like doing like, we kind of like design the app. You see what the app's going to look like. You tweak yeah. the app a bit. That like, you mean you get to play around on your phone? And like, it was amazing the first time I got to install the early version of it and be like, oh wow, it's no longer this shitty PDF. It's like looks nice, but like, so you get excited about that. But you can't celebrate it because it's not on the app store. Mm. And then like, do you mean you click a button and that, or whatever? Like we do you mean, then approve it. It gets to the app store review committee. They review it. It gets published and then it's online. And then, like, we're, we're having to operate with the PDF still in existence and the App Store online, so we haven't, like, turned off the PDFs. Oh, you have them both the same? And other than because, like, imagine if you were a customer, you bought a PDF one day, we launched it out the next day. What do we do? Delete your PDF? Yeah. So we had to, like, cater to both. So, like, there was never a day that we, like, had this huge celebration that we're now on, on the internet. And it didn't suddenly go viral. Mm. Like, nothing really changed. And I think, like, the entire journey of Runner since launching the Run Buddy with this PDF service three years ago during to being where we are now, there was never a day where, like, fireworks went off and the business went viral. Like, it's just been incrementally every day. How can we make it a tiny bit better? And like, nothing's changed. I feel and like you live so... by that. I feel like that's your that's your way to approach a lot of stuff. Well, maybe maybe like I do. I don't, think I, don't know, like, I don't think I've ever like picked them apart and said it in that way. But I think it's also just like, like the same with everything. Like, mm. the, uh, I mean, it's, it's probably the reason you could probably unpick almost every business. And it's probably the way that that's the case. Like, I mean, Apple didn't suddenly like, obviously they launched an iPhone and it went really well. Mm. But like, they will have worked so hard for years and years and years, gradually making everything better. And then as a result, you look back and you're like, oh my God, look at this cool thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think we just kind of like knew we wanted to build this amazing running coach. And we wanted to help as many people as we could, as best as we possible all around the world. And I mm. think like right now, there's a lot that we can do to keep making it better. And that's so exciting. Yeah. Um, and I'm quite sure that until we've like ticked off everything on our list, which the list keeps growing probably faster <laughs> than we can tick it off. So we don't need to worry. Yeah. Um, we won't run out of exciting things to work on. Yeah. And so the app's launched and, and things are obviously going well. You're obviously trying to improve the product all the time. Getting to the stage from that place, which is early 21. Yeah. So launched the website 2021 March. Yeah. Launched the app Mar- April 2022. And at the yeah. same time, raised half a million pounds from our 303 earliest kind and of what was that raised for was that to go into the kind of next stage of actually getting this yeah so it's like june relatively we're making some money from these pdfs yeah but like we have kind of proved at this point that like this is something that could go somewhere mm-hmm. but for, for a business to really take off and a tech business to really take off you need a lot of money and a lot of resource to build all these different things yeah we needed more than just one app developer we needed a team and we needed more than just me and katie doing the marketing we needed a team to first of all talk to our customers and to mm-hmm. Do you mean talk to the future customers to grow out our team of ambassadors, talk to all the races? Yeah. Um, so anyway, we needed to raise some money to scale both halves of the business. Um, so yeah, sold kind of 10% of the business, raised half a million pounds um, and gradually grew the team. And I think at the same time, we're taking out, are we talking about the same time? Um, no. So we then continued to work from an office, um, co-working space and just worked from like kind of hot desking essentially yeah. from there through till the end of the year. Um, and it was only at the end of the year that we take out our first private office of nine desks. So from April when we launched the app, we're literally hot desking, working in cafes from April through till Christmas time. And then January the 1st of 2023, we take out our first office of, of nine desks. And then from that perspective, it's it, what was the plan for 2023? Just keep building. Income. Yeah. So, so um, and just the, the extra context at the end of 2022, we raised some more money. So we raised our first VC led round. So the app went well, launching it in during April. Come the end of the year, we get to like 2,000 paid customers. Yeah. And grew quite steadily, making a bit of making a bit of money, seeing some really good data points in lots of different ways. And we're able to excite some investors. And for context, this is like the worst point in time to raise money. This is like mini budget chaos. Time, yeah. Right? So like yeah. it was miserable. I remember going for like a lunch with one of my like very good friends who worked in tech and had raised some money. And like, I start asking him some questions, and I like didn't realize how like down the dump the dump had finally got because of how hard it was was getting. And then mm. anyway, we managed to pull it together and get yeah. get some great VC investment in and continue to scale. Um, anyway, so we kind of two thousand paying customers, raised some money, so we, we raised a two million pound round uh, and sold a bit more of the business. Um, went out, took out our first office, nine desk office. And I mean, therefore, probably had nine people at the time, um, <laughs> or maybe maybe six or seven, and probably kept a few spare seats. Um, and then from there, it's continued to kind of like gradually get better or snowball, um, incrementally getting a little bit better over time. And from from there, so we took out the first office nine desks in January the first, twenty twenty three. June the first, we're taking out an eighteen desk office, so we like dropped one floor down and got a bit more space. 
Um, and then October the 1st, we're then moving to the end of the corridor to a 30 desk office. And on February the 1st of um, this year, um, so 2024, um, we knocked down a wall and go from 30 to 40 desks. Um, and now we're trying to negotiate the office to get a few more desks somewhere. So when you raised that first VC round, was that purely investing in the growth in terms of like, why were you raising so much and what was the purpose of doing it at that stage? Because obviously the growth has happened. Was that aligned with what you planned? So I think like everything that we think about, everything that we care about is making the app better. Yeah. And we could do it, but if you have two developers to build rather in the way that we want it to be, it would probably take like 200 years. Mm. Um, so right now we have 25 developers. It's probably going to take us 15 years. I'm quite sure by the end of this year, we might have 40 developers. And so maybe like the, the time frame gets shorter. Yeah. Like we want to build the best running coaching app in the world that could help anyone, no matter your needs, um, no matter whether you're a diehard Olympic marathon runner or a complete beginner to running. And to do that, there's an enormous amount to do. And so relatively, we want to put as many amazing experts on the case to build that up as much as possible. Yeah. At the same time, to be able to continue fueling this, we do need to put runner in front of people and sell some running plans to then keep bringing money into the business to be a sustainable and healthy business. So with everything that we do, we're scaling the, the product and making the product as phenomenal as possible. And then also kind of scaling the, the go-to-market team as well. Yeah. How did you find building a team? Yeah, I mean, I would say like, so managing my first member of staff was like an odd experience. I'd only ever managed like season airs in a holiday resort which with people who just like wanted to have fun and chill out so that wasn't very hard so managing real life people not real life people grown adults <laughs> doing a grown job yeah. um was like a challenge especially when like i was the youngest person in the team um i think like i mean until we were like seven people i was the youngest person so relatively having to be like in charge and be sensible and i'm hopefully coming across that i'm not really boring and old uh but i'm like fun and energetic hopefully yeah um meaning that like having to like turn on my serious face the rest of the time and like um, not make a fool of myself was like mm. a challenge. Um, and during having to interview people, and I'd also never worked in a company in a normal sense before. I was a PT running coach, worked at a hotel in Greece, but I'd never like interviewed someone. I'd never like to have known what like annual leave was or like normal job type things. So it was very bizarre to be like in charge of people and having to tell them about their working contracts or whatever it is, not mm. having ever seen one before. Um, so it was just like learning on the job really. And I think like so much of it has just been learning as we go. And, and maybe one of the strengths getting to where we are now is that like, I'm not looking at like I mean, the big corporate business I was at for the last 10 years and looking at like all the good things they do and then like take the good bits out of that and putting yeah. that into what we do now. Instead, like we're not even like copying from a good business. We're just starting from scratch. So we're not limited by being good. We could be like, brilliant because rather than thinking like how do we keep our employees happy oh this was a good policy we had it's just like what would actually make us happy mm. let's just do that yeah and as a result some of the things we do are just like odd and like so who cares like as in like you could probably observe a weekend runner and be like that's a really unusual company but like everyone seems to be really happy and like that's great and so we're not like stuck by being in convention because like i haven't been in a normal job um, and like to speak for that like we're a fitness company we're a running coaching business I, I know that moving makes me happy. No one should sit at a desk all day. On Monday at 9.05, we do a Bring Sally Up challenge, which is um, a song. If you've never heard of it, it's like Bring Sally Up and then it says Bring Sally Down and you could do it with press-ups, you could do it with squats, you could do it with sit-ups, you could do it with calf raises, you could do it with whatever. Anyone can do it. Um, and we do that online or in person. Whoever's in person does it. We log in all the online people and we do that. And we do it again on Friday. And like, that's fun. Like, why should we start the day with like, hello, nice online call how boring and then mm. do we do that and it's so funny because like in a week sometimes i won't interact with the tech people other than like to see them for their morning squats on a monday and their press-ups on a friday <laughs> and like that's fun like why wouldn't you do that yeah um but like do you mean if i'd worked at deloitte for 10 years they wouldn't do that so i wouldn't have learned that's something that you can do mm. um do you know, and there's so many different things that like like that that we do that like i think it helps having this kind of like fresh mind to it yeah um and at the end of the day everything comes just to like what is the best running coach app we can be? What is the best way we can make our employees happy so they can do good work and make a good business? Um, and I think like as a result, accidentally, it might be a sustainable business that makes lots of money one day, but like, who cares? Like that's genuinely like the, the thoughts that like Dom and I have. 
Um, you, you keep mentioning the kind of making the best app possible. What, why is that so important to the business, if that makes sense? So why do you think that is the be all and end all of what you do? You know, obviously you guys do a lot of the marketing, you're building great teams, et cetera, but it's all focused on this one core value. What, what's going to make the difference for the business in the long term with that? Well, I think like, what is a business? Like the, the business is like the app and who uses the app. And like, as in like, so the business is the app. Mm-hmm. As in like, that is all it is. So like our marketing is, hey guys, we've got a cool app. Do you know, our ambassadors are, hey guys, we're using this really cool app. Yeah. And like, do you know, our kit is like, hey, look, this is the name of a really cool app. Like, I'm telling you about a really cool app. So all that matters is making a really great app that really helps people. Mm. And so like, as a result, what's the most important thing to do? Just make a really good app. Yeah. And like, if we can make a really good app, it will mean that people genuinely live longer doing they will run faster they will be healthier they will be happier they will then probably tell their friends that this is a really good app and they will market for us and i mean like we get more than half our customers coming in from other customers really and like as a result i think if we focus on having a really really good app Hmm. we can be quite good at lots of other things and that's okay but if we had a really average product and we're quite good at marketing we would be zero and it, I think you could be phenomenal at marketing or phenomenal at other things to sell an average product. But if you have a phenomenal, phenomenal product, it will just sell itself. And that like, relatively, that's what we do. Like for us to go and work with an ambassador, we have to be like, hello, name. Like, <laughs> would you like to try out this thing? they will be like, okay, here you go. Use it for free. Come back in like three weeks. Tell us what you think. They're like, it's the shit. We're like, oh, great. Now we can work together. Like that's how it works. Yeah. So what do we want to do? Make a really good app. And that makes everything work. Well, it, it, yeah. That that's the business. But do you think a lot of brands are doing that? Do you think that's the less particularly in, you know, health and wellness, et cetera, there are there are lots of there's lots of marketing that happens. I mean, obviously I've built marketing agencies and all about it, but like there's lots of marketing of average or bad products, whereas it feels like for you guys it's the complete opposite, which is why I ask so much about it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean I think like to to speak for the examples of the two big gym the do you mean the gym chain and the fitness business I use, like yeah. I don't think they're great businesses. Mm. So yes. Um, yeah, I don't want to list all the businesses out there that I think are not great but I think no I think completely like um, some businesses help people in some ways yeah some businesses are completely awful business do you mean you've got tobacco businesses out there cigarette businesses they help no one mm. but there's enough marketing and whatever out there that means that they can make some money um, and I think that's where like if you focus on money you don't need like if you focus on money, you can sell tobacco and if you sell enough cigarettes, you can make a business that makes yeah. money. I'm quite sure that if enough government rules change one day, that will end an industry and that'd yeah. be great. Um, but by not starting with making money, we make a good business. It will hopefully accidentally make money and mean that we can all keep doing our jobs and keep making, keep paying our employees to do some press-ups at 9.05 on Monday. <laughs> um but I think by starting with how can we help people best leads to a good outcome. And I'm sure there are businesses out there that are doing the same. I'm sure there are businesses out there that just think about how they can put more t-shirts on bodies or whatever yeah. it is. And like, we don't care about that. And like an example of that is that like, we focus on making a great app. And as a result, we have people who like, re- like, ru- like running with our app mm-hmm. and like, can, can we have a running tank top? And we're like, oh, well, we're doing not very good at tank tops, but like, we'll, we'll get good at it. So we can make you some tank tops. And then it's like, okay, well, what do we charge for tank tops? You like look at it online. It's like Nike, 90, 70 pounds, like Adidas, 70 pounds. Like that's what it costs for a tank top. We're like, but it, it's literally like we've, we've sourced the highest quality tank tops we can get. They're like sustainably made and they're like 20 pounds to make. So like we need to keep some money for like distribution and storage and whatever. Yeah. But like we're selling for 27.99. And like genuinely, like you go and take a tank top, which we haven't launched yet, but it's it's not online yet. We sold it at the London Marathon Expo for our London Marathon customers. Mm. Um, and like, it's as good as you can get from doing the top brands. Yeah. And like, as a result, what is what do we want to do? Make the very best tank top that we can make in a really doing good quality, long lasting, ethical way and give it to our customers, make them better. Make them, doing, make them better at running. And like, doing, there's enough margin in the app to mean that we can prop up some nice kid and make them happy. Yeah. And like, we could sell them at 70 pounds, make loads of money. But like, we want to make it better for that one customer to have a better happier life through running and like yeah. i'm very very lucky that i love running and like some of my clients or i love exercise and some of my clients would literally be like i wish i loved doing going to the gym as much as you you make it seem so easy 
And it's like, I'm so lucky that that's the way I feel. And I want to make, I want to teach people through runner to enjoy running and exercise in that same way, in a sustainable, healthy way. I'm like what I described with Weight Watchers and doing that's great. By doing it in that way, we'll have enough of our happy runners out there telling their friends about runner. And as a result, it's a tech business. It doesn't need to mean, do it. If someone subscribes and trains with us, we don't need to go and relatively, it's not a, there's a lot of margin in it. So we can therefore just focus on making this great app and it will prop itself up. Um, and it, it kind of makes obvious sense when you think about it that way um, and, and describe it. Obviously not all businesses can do this this way because if all we did was make tank tops, we need to make enough money off the tank tops to then pay for our performance marketing and pay for our ambassadors and pay yeah. for everything else. But we don't need to pay for any of those things yeah. because like we have some people who are enjoying using the app and they're loving it anyway. So like we can then just make some kit and give it to them at the price we buy it for. Do you feel purpose over profit resonates with kind of your philosophy as a business? Yeah, I've never put it in those words, but yeah, but yeah, I think it's kind of that focus. Yeah, we just we just want to we just want to help people live a healthier, happier life through running. Amazing. What's been some of the challenges for you guys building building what you built? Um, well, I think there's personal challenges. Um, I think from a before before going on to the personal ones from a work challenge i think the hardest thing has been raising raising money to be able to continue making things bigger and better yeah and i think that's because it's a space that's not popular in the in, in investment space you've got businesses like peloton that haven't done well since covid yeah um you've also got businesses like strava which are an amazing business but they don't make that much money because most mm. people would have paid for strava so then you've got these investors who are looking at strava and looking at peloton and being like well the industry is not a very good business industry even if you win so is that I, kind of where you were situated early doors? That's well, it is more that like you're, you're an investor looking at Runner, which is a fitness business. Yeah. So they're thinking, right, if Runner did unbelievably well, it could be as good as Peloton or as good as Strava, let's yeah. say. Yeah. But Peloton and Strava aren't that good commercial businesses. So they're thinking the chance of you winning is like 0.01%. Mm -hmm. And if you win, it's not even like that good. So therefore, it's really hard to convince investors to invest, especially in the middle of this economic downturn that we're raising in. Yeah. So I'd say those are the, that's the hardest thing we've had to do. We've had two very different VC-led raises. So we talked about the one that I said we raised £2 million at the end of 2022. Mm -hmm. We then went on to raise another round at the end of 2023, where we raised £5 million. And it was a very different situation because the business has proved a lot more. We were growing really, really fast in this second time round. Um, got so many happy customers, so many happy reviews. The business is economically in a really good position during the brands taking off. And so we kind of went from one experience of basically pleading with anyone in London to put any money into the business to then like everyone in London pleading to put money into our business. Really? Um, and since then, it's been even funnier where by like, we just have like amazingly cool people that like doing celebrities who come across us, train with us and say it's great. And then be like, can we do you, buy some of your company? And we're like, genuinely, we don't want any more money. And we just want to like focus on building the app. Right. And so it's been like a really interesting like, spiral and and yeah. right now i guess the challenge is how do we do what we've done in london in the rest of the world um so those are maybe the like the business type challenges and i think the the hardest one which comes on to the personal one is like just not having enough time and not having enough resource like mm. we have so many customers out there now and like i said at the start when we had 100 customers they would write in a few emails and say can you work on this we've got hundreds of thousands of people now asking for hundreds and thousands of things yeah so like there's so much more for us to do for us to build um so even though we've now got more team to provide these things the we just can't keep up we're always the shortest resources team time mm. um so we have to be so strict on saying no to opportunities um and as a result it comes back to the personal challenge that i'll go on to say which is just like it's chaos so that, as in like it's yeah. it's so hard as yeah. in it like just like no my like progress is my thing i want to get better at being an iron man every year i want to do a faster time in my Ironman. i want to be fitter i want to be healthier i want to be stronger mm. and since we launched the run buddy i have gone sideways or backwards personally yeah uh, and that's really hard mm. um and to speak for that in the investment round we had at the end of last year so the one we raised five million pounds we probably had two or three months of extremely intense meetings with all these different funds australian funds uk funds in the day and then us funds at night because of the time change you're working for a crazy time while also trying to keep the 20 employees that we had at the time busy and happy yeah. running the business talking to our customers running events and where whatever's going on um at the end of this kind of two or three months period we get this amazing offer we get this amazing deal we get it over the line and i start to get this pain in my right leg um and basically one of the vertebrae the discs in between my vertebrae bulged into my spinal cord so I have this pain in my right leg, but it's all coming from a nerve in my back that's tricking me that my hamstring's in trouble, but actually it's just my nerve that's in trouble. 
Um, so through October through to November, I'm doing less and less, trying to rest and trying to get it better. In December, I couldn't move. Um, as in, I, I didn't run in December. I would be like lying on my back in bed. I'd be lying on my belly on the, doing lying on the floor with a laptop or standing. And I couldn't do any of the other options. What was uh, this? So basically sitting down too much. So I'd be sitting down for 15, 16 hours a day. I was stressed because raising an investment round feels like life or death. It's like, will they invest in you and keep the business going or not? Yeah. So it feels like life or death, even though it's not life. It, that one specifically wasn't life or death. It was like a life or a slightly different life that's not as exciting, but mm. you can still live. But so it feels like life or death in the moments. So you're full of stress. You're working super, super hard. Then doing exactly not what someone should do, which is that because I was so short on time, the only exercise I did was extremely intense exercise. As in, so it'd be like, I still do it. I do a Wednesday morning club cycle of an hour's cycling in a in a group, in a line behind crazy, crazy people as fast as you can. Um, but then I would relatively not have time to do any other exercise other than cycle to and from work, which I was trying to do as fast as I could so I could get home for the next meeting or get in and so I could maximize on sleep or whatever it was. And then it would just be like meetings all day long, doing getting into the office, taking some calls with Australian funds, doing traveling around London on line bikes or whatever it is to meet all these, these London funds and then talking with a few US funds, um, to the point where I'd even like sleep on the floor in the office a few times. So it was really like chaotic. Um, and then during on the weekend, I'm like, oh, I'm free. I can go and exercise. And I'd just be doing a half marathon one day. I'd be doing a triathlon the next day. So I'd be like, because I am so excited, I want to do with doing keep getting fitter. I'd be like yeah. trying to shove all this energy onto the weekend. And basically just the combination of all of those things together, unfortunately, meant that had this had this problem. And it just gradually got, got worse and worse. And I had, a, had an epidural, so an injection in my spinal cord to kind of numb the nerve. Uh, which allowed me to start building up in, in January. So I could do a, I did park run on the 1st of January this year. And that was doing hard yeah. and like scary. I didn't even know if I'd get round and it was like uncomfortable and like gradually being able to build up. And we're now at the end of April, I did the Paris marathon fortnight to go and got round and that went really well. And I'm now, I still have some residual nerve pain, but I'm able to run and cycle pain free. Yeah. Um, so I can keep building up and I'm back to being help, happy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was Great a really, news. really tough period. And I think like, the entirety of not just that period, but just like balancing having this undeniable commitment to this really exciting thing and the undeniable commitment to all of these people that are paying us money to yep. give them this great experience, like don't want to let any of them down. And as a result, it's really hard to do anything else. Mm. So I'm like, I'm addicted to running. I'm addicted to Iron Man, but I'm like more addicted to work. Yeah. So then I'm like sad that I'm not like feeding this addiction. Mm. Um, and so that's like something that I've got to, deal with and work on and and it's always hard have you found that balance in any way i i think i think we have a lot more balance or i have a lot more balance now yeah. but it's definitely like it goes through ebbs and flows like mm. i would say the last few weeks or months maybe I, i'm probably just going to mean that it just actually looking back it just hasn't quite got to good balance but like yeah. it goes through ebbs and flows where sometimes it's like okay actually this is okay and then like something goes wrong mm. no as in like there's 45 employees so if one doesn't pull their weight like naturally the people around them might cover it a little bit but it's yep. probably going to mean that if something goes wrong on the tech side of things like dom's going to be stressed because he's going to either be dealing to hire the person that we need to get or whatever it's going to be and if something goes wrong on the non-tech side of things like doing everyone else is busy because everyone else has got the same problem because the business is growing so fast so naturally it's going to refer up the chain i mean that i'm picking up the slack yeah um and so um that's always been the case yeah um, and sometimes it's only a little bit hard and sometimes it's really hard mm. um probably right now it's on the upper side of hard just because we've had busy time of London Marathon and yeah. and all kinds of different things going on and um, we've been hiring for a few roles and we haven't got them all in doing hired and trained up and everything so yeah. we're all basically covering all the roles that we're hiring for until they're hired mm. and then hopefully it'll get a bit calmer but the reality that we've seen for the last three years is that because the business grows we'll then need more people and we'll then yeah. have to hire for them and we almost we want to be a business that's also sustainable so despite being a venture back business which means you can grow off the the money that you've brought in early we don't really want to hire people that we can't afford based on the revenues that we're making okay. so we're actually not hiring in anticipation we're hiring because we're not busy and what and i think that? by living in that way it does mean that it's intense yeah why do you want to do that i think it's just a sensible way to be on the back of kind of like all these tech back businesses that like lived in a completely unsustainable thing and then left laid everyone off like we don't want to hire everyone do you imagine we can afford 100 we can afford 10 members of staff based on the number of subscribers we've got yeah we should have 10 members of scarf like we can probably like the day we get to like being able to afford 11 let's hire an 11th um but i think it would be unfair to these people to have 20 members of staff paid for by run and knowing that we've only got a year's worth of money for them 
Yeah. That's their lives. Yeah. Like not only do we have this huge amount of um commitment to our runners who subscribe and choose to train with us, choose to follow, genuinely like they are opening their app and they will run the exact run that morning because we tell them to. Like they're they're literally trusting us in that way, which is amazing. Yeah. But so we've got a huge sense of responsibility to set them the very most perfect workouts. Mm. But then in the same way, the responsibility to our employees, which is even one step further, not only are they choosing what to do with us for an hour of their day four times a week, they're choosing what to do, like our runners do, they're choosing what to do 40 hours a week or more and their livelihoods. And some of them do even have children. Like they can't be working for a runner if we've only got a year's worth of money in the bank for them because we're paying them unsustainably. Yeah. Um, and so I think with that in mind, like, and do you mean, Dom and I don't want to live in a business that we're like, worried that's going to be bankrupt in a year mm. so instead like we want to run a sustainable healthy business and as a result we during relatively grow a lot slower than we probably could do but we also grow in a way that is a sustainable healthy business i love that i think there's a there's a there's a big need for that within many many industries within the uk and the us i mean covid was crazy of how many businesses were just raising huge amounts of cash and burning through it all the time and and i think that that bubble's kind of popped now it doesn't seem to exist um i just want to ask you about the future where you really think runner can go yeah no i think um yeah like i said we're like 20 percent of the way there so without kind of like listing off our entire roadmap like i want runner to give the experience that a western world olympian has um but in an affordable and accessible package for the masses and what that means is that imagine you're doing an olympian training for the paris marathon this year you'll have your data scientist you have your strength strength coach your nutritionist your running coach your all of these different people and that's amazing for that one person or the the 20 people in the world that get that experience mm. but we're in this interesting position where there's so much data on you mean on your whoop band on my garmin watch on your apple watch whatever it is that we're wearing mm. that means that we have a lot of information about someone's sleep around their stress around maybe their menstrual cycle from the flow app from their um doing their availability from their google calendar all of these different things yeah. so we want to take all of these different data points to continuously optimize and adjust your training as if you had all of these different scientists looking at your running all the time, but doing it in a way that's so simple and easy that if you're just on your couch to 5k journey, that it's not so complicated and daunting to go and use. But at the same time, that's the experience If somebody wants to shave a 230 marathon into a 228 marathon they need. And so building out all of that experience, we want to make it so that you get injured, you can click a button, you got injured and we'll help you get, get back on track based on what that injury is. Or if you, do you mean you go got you got COVID and you need to miss out in training for a week or two? Do you mean you come back at the moment in two weeks' time your training's going to have got a bit harder because we didn't know that, and that's really shit. Yeah. So to solve that at the moment, you've got to message us. We'll help you get back on track and adjust your plan. But like we should be able to see that you've missed your training from your runner app, from your Garmin watch, your Apple watch, from your Strava account, which we sync to all of these different things, and then to be able to say, Joe, you know we actually saw you missed your workouts. Are you ill? Are you demotivated and lazy? Have you been on holiday or are you injured? Like, based on all of those different outcomes, we should then be able to give you the right plan of action to get you back on track. And you should be able to tell us that you've got club runs on a Tuesday and that you also want to run with your mate or your girlfriend on a Friday and you and your girlfriend need to sync up their training. So sync those two plans together. Like, there is, that, Jimmy, that's just on the app. That, sorry, that's just on the workouts that we're setting you. There's also the way that we deliver it to you. We want to be able to show you these really amazing insights based on how your, your training is progressing over time and to make it really exciting so you can chat to different people in the community who are training for a similar goal. Like, imagine you're both doing in paris training for the london marathon you should be able to join the paris london marathon community go on a training run and do and meet up with each other and ask each other different questions what hotel should you go and stay at when you're in london like all of those things need to happen and like we kind of know what we need in five years and so the challenge is which bits do we do now and which bits do we work on in like three months time and which mm. bits do we work on in two years time um but anyway so that's yeah our vision for runner is build the very best coaching app in the world that could help any runner of any ability train for any running goal I just love how passionate you are about when you speak about the future as well. Well, it's just, just so daunting. Be... it's so daunting because like that is an enormous piece of stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, like, yeah. so therefore I'm like just continuously sad that we don't have all of those things. And I like, yeah. you know, I've seen some designs of some of the bits that are coming next, and yeah. I know what people are working on, but it's like it's not there yet. So yeah, then when yeah. someone's like, do you mean I meet someone doing the London Marathon Expo, and they're like, do you know what? I I love the app, but the one thing you should really do is like this thing. And I'm like, well, if you can come up with something that we haven't already thought of, like that's it won't happen because we've got you know, we get I don't know ten thousand messages a week. 10,000 a week with yeah, recommendations. Yeah, for people chatting to us and saying like, oh, how do I sync my Garmin watch? Or, right. or like, oh, I love that. Thank you so much. Or whatever it is. Like, and as a result, there's a button that you can click request a feature. So like everything, every, it'd be very, very rare that I'm going to chat to someone in real life or in, in person 
who's going to come up with that idea we haven't already thought of. And so then internally, we're then ranking how, how hard it is to make that feature, yeah. how valuable it'll be, who it will touch, how many people are asking for it. And that determines the order that we work on all these things. And the balance. Um, and as a result, it's like frustrating to go and chat to people and they're like, oh, I really want you to add like, do you mean, having it so that my my paces adapt around my performance like that's a feature that's about to launch so i don't mind telling you about it but like <laughs> and so we're looking back at your last four to six weeks on your strava on your runner on your garmin on your apple watch based on how fast you are whether you're beating your targets or not beating your targets will adjust your, tra- your training for you like that makes sense like it's really complicated to do it well yeah so it's taken us a long time to build that feature but it's something that's coming it's something so exciting but therefore if someone tells me that it's like annoying that they don't have it now and like it's annoying that everything on that list that i said doesn't happen now like it's annoying the runner doesn't adapt around your menstrual cycle yet yeah it's really good we've got more reviews like more five-star reviews than any running coaching app out there mm. but it's annoying that it's not got all the things that we want and so that's like the you know, i've got a lot of enthusiasm but it's also frustrating that we yeah have of course today of course but i mean it sounds like you've got the right team and and you and dom have got the right attitude of how to get there i mean the, the final question for me is what does it take to build an app like runner well, I think you, you kind of said it there. It's doing super smart people. I don't know one line of code. Like, I don't know. I don't know what code is. Yeah. Uh, so I think to build anything that's great, you need a lot of great people. And like, I think we started off with a lot of different skills between Dom and I. So we could get off the ground with him knowing to mean enough about tech, enough about how to actually build a company, finance and legal and how to like to mean, hire someone. And I knew enough about like, absorbing social media running and all of these yeah. different things that like meant that we could you know, relatively build a lot of the start and since then we've realized that we're actually missing a lot of doing you know, gaps as the business needs to grow needs to take itself to doing you know, a higher dimension to some extent and that's where we just continue to like work out what are we actually good at and let's keep doing those things mm. and the bits we're not let's just get brilliant people in to do those things and that's still the case like doing you know, it's the case that our it might be that our marketing is scaling to the need to, need to go up another level. And so we need to get more great people. We need to get a videographer in who can make better quality videos or whatever it's going to be. Um, Dream, we need to have, Dream, we, we've now got like five machine learning engineers, like, but actually like we need now someone who can actually sit with them and project manage them because, or whatever it's going to be. So we need amazing experts in all these different areas. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, like the, the one thing is an amazing group of people but that amazing group of people, not only are they smart on paper and doing, they can do their things and have the skills, but they actually care. And I think that's something that we find is that like, when we're interviewing people, yes, we want to have someone who is smart and can do their job, but actually we want someone who really cares about what they're building. And that's going to be the case of actually like not missing a typo in their code or like not missing a typo when they put a marketing post out. And like that level of care it's going to mean that they're satisfied doing their job. Like the reason why Dom and I are satisfied is because we get these reviews from people who do you mean, give us a five star and say how happy they are. Yeah. Like that makes us feel amazing. Yeah. And we need the type of people who feel the same because then we're all going to work hard on this thing together and enjoy it at the same time. Um, so I think that's what it takes. Just a group of do you mean, seriously smart people, smarter than me. Um, but hopefully you care nearly as much as me. <laughs> like if you, I think you give yourself a discount, but I hear what you're saying. Ben, thanks so much. I really appreciate chatting with you today and congrats because what you guys are doing over at Runner is is nothing short of extraordinary and I'm excited to see all the iterations that will be coming soon. And I know also we haven't spoken about a, a whole other half of what you've achieved and, and what you guys have done at Runner. So thank you. Congrats on what you've done. I'm excited to see the future and, um, and yeah, best of luck. Well, thank you very much. Enjoyed our show with you. Thanks, Ben.